Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our navigating the Gen AI generative artificial intelligences、um, landscape. I focus on student learning. We really want to focus on student learning, <laughs>、um, mainly because this is also exam season, and we will also use、um, be looking at how we can design our prompt. And the, today's session is mainly facilitated by Manuel and Lucas. Um, to begin, I would like to acknowledge that we are、um, situated. Lucas,、uh, I am facilitating the workshop from campus、um, on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam-speaking people. And we also recognize some of you may be joining from UBC Okanagan, that's located on the、um, territory of the Silic people. It's Important for us to acknowledge where we are and our connections to the land,、um, especially when we are exploring another new innovations in humanities. We generative AI has been with us for many years that we may not notice, or we may notice that it's been around. But last year has been, and I would call it an explosion, and making it much more accessible to many of of us, and that we can actually try using it, not just as a consumer on one end. As we are continue to use it, and you know, everyday life, or as we may attempt to bring it into our classroom, I think it's important for us to remember that we should be using this new tool to. Connect to with our students to maybe using the tools as a means so that we can start having more conversation with our students so that the students can have more discussion and and as a result of our discussion and our learning and our teaching we are working towards making our world our land our water our plants and animals all a better place and better for future generations. So、um, we are. This is something new. It's in our society now. It's in our everyday life now.、Um, but we need to learn, understand, and use it responsibility with、um, with caring responsibility when we use it. So、um, that's. I would like to acknowledge that. And some housekeeping. We have a lot of participants here today, so please stay muted throughout the session, and use the chat to ask questions, share your thought,、um, and ask question. We also、um, develop a worksheets and some resources that is in this Google document.、Um, I note. I note that Manuel has already shared a link. So use the link to open the document and follow along, and you may want to keep the link、um, for future reference. The session is also being recorded, and、um, so feel free to turn your camera off. And、um, the caption is on, so again, also you may hide your caption, you may expand it, so, so use it, however, to make your the session more accessible to your need. Um, feel free to follow along. Lucas will be making a lot of demonstration, and this is my first time watching Lucas um using Bing Copilot, Bing Chat, also known as Copilot, um in our demo session. So if you would like also like to follow along, um to use Bing Chat, you need to use the browser Microsoft Edge. So if you're used to Using Firefox or Chrome, you may need to make a switch now. You may need to use、um, you need to use Microsoft Edge.、Um, if you're like me, you are already logged into the UBC Microsoft Enterprise Systems, then my UBC login will be visible, and you on the very top right corner of your screen, you will see this little Copilot icon. Click on it, then you will get the Bing Chat. Um, if you like for your academic work, we recommend using the more precise mode.、Um, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, and you've heard about ChatGPT 3.5, or you have the paid version ChatGPT 4, you can still use it, or you can use other AI tools that you've been exploring. 
So it's just we I we would like to let you know that we may um use some of the demo on Bing Chat. Is it cable? What wait, let me see. Okay, I will try to I, I do hear myself rubbing some cable. Let me be sit very still for now. So my agenda, I can still hear you. Um for the agenda, so we will do some quick refreshing. Like I said, we need to think about our connections to our course and our land. Um, we will go quickly go through some what is Gen AI. What do we know? What do we know in the last year? And we will have another refreshing activity for you. Um, there will be we will think about again um using Gen AI for student learning, and then using um and also for assessment and also thinking about how to transform some of the classroom assignment using Gen AI. So our first activity, oops, we would like you to go through some, I'm not hold, I'm not touching any button now. Um, so our first activity, we have a few questions for you and we would like to hear your response or see your response from a Padlet. Yes, one more slide. I'm not touching anything. Yes. So what we would like to hear, what do you teach? What do you design? What courses do you design? And what courses do you support? Um, what's the goal? Before we play with Gen AI, let's really anchor ourselves. What's the goal of our courses? What's the goal of our teaching? And perhaps if you, are, if you work with your industry, um, what is the significance of Gen AI in your discipline, in the industry that where your students will be going into or supporting? And finally, we also would like to know what you hope to get out from this session. So Manuel has already put in a link in the, um, in the chat. So that's um, that will lead you to the Padlet. And we are going to wait for about, I would say, 20-ish. I would like to see a full screen of different responses before we move on. So take your time and um, enter your response. Or you are someone who like to think, then I hope that you are reflecting on your courses, your teaching goals, what's happening in your industry, and what do you like to get out from this workshop? And I just noticed someone put on the Padlet that they're hoping to get out of the session understanding about ethical issues related to using Gen AI. Gen AI. And just to mention that um, this is Lucas speaking, um, that ethics isn't something we really focused on in this session, but just a you know a quick mention it's worth always foregrounding and thinking about the ethics of these tools right now there's a lot of questions around private data being put into these tools about equity and bias of these tools um, among many other issues including environmental ethics of the impacts around these tools maybe one ethical way of the uh, kind of goal of this session is to get all of us on board and help us all learn so that we're better able to have informed conversations about what these tools do and what the ethical considerations are. And I'll also make, this is Lucas again, one more response on the Padlet is about someone's goal is to know what the university policies and practices are with generative AI. And maybe Manuel, if you get a chance, you can share the Gen AI website from CTLT where we talk a little bit about overall policies as well as the academic integrity site. But currently there's a committee at the university, a steering committee looking at generative AI, but there isn't a formal policy. This is being done on a faculty by faculty basis right now, um, as well as some guidance from the academic integrity office. The rest of your goals really align with the workshop. I just wanted to jump in on those two goals while we had a chance. 
So thank you. Can you hear me, Lucas? Because I just um changed my my microphone headset. Um, so thank you very much for all the contribution. I haven't had a chance because I was busy changing my um audio system. And but Lucas, please keep going because the next session is over to you. Wonderful. Thanks. So let I'm just gonna kind of get us all <clears throat> onto the same page a little bit, and that's a really quick overview, about five minutes, about what do we mean by generative AI. And maybe just to before I jump into that, can I get you to put in the chat either I'm, I'm going to get you to hold off for a second and then I'm going to get you to put a one in the chat if you're brand new to generative AI, two if you've been playing with a little bit, and three if you've used it quite a bit. So just write it in the chat, okay? So I'm going to count down one, two, three, great. And so we have a lot of twos here, which is great. And I see we have some threes here, um, not seeing too many ones these days. So we'll keep this introduction fairly short. And it's great to see so many people kind of experimenting, playing and learning about these tools. So what is generative AI? Um, you know, in a nutshell, it's studying vast amounts of data, and this data is scraped from the internet. It's using inference to make predictions based on this data and based on those predictions, complex predictions about words and grammar, it's able to generate new data, um, sim like writing a story, images, et cetera. And I think when we were first talking about AI, there was discussions of these tools being like a stochastic parrot and perhaps just a fancy autocomplete. I think most of that's gone away now. What we're seeing is some pretty incredible capabilities of creating natural language and doing things like being able to achieve in the 90th percentile of the, the standard bar exam, being able to write critical reflections that achieve higher than students do and are indistinguishable from student work. And I mean, if any of you have played with it, which it looks like most of you have, I think this is far beyond the idea of a stochastic parrot at this point. So I wanted to quickly mention about what are these tools trained on? And I think this brings up some interesting ethical questions. And it's also useful to think about. So this is some of the training data that chat gpt 3.5 is trained on unfortunately for chat gpt 4 they've they're not clear they're not transparent about their training data anymore so it's difficult to know what it's being trained on but i put a link in the worksheet to common crawl a lot of chat gpt 3.5 is built off common crawl which is a historical web archive um, similar to google's index and it's 13 years with petabytes of web data, billions of pages over 40 languages, and trillions of interconnected hyperlinks. Secondly, a more contentious one is it's trained on book three. Right now, there's a lot of folks on the internet in the copyright era trying to figure out just what's in the book three database. But we know that there's a lot of books that are copyright, a lot of books that are open search your favorite novel written before 2021. And generally you're gonna be able to have it summarize it, have it interact with the book, as well as the entire Wikipedia knowledge base in the English language. So that's just a couple of the data points, but huge reams of internet data that it's been trained on. And the third point I wanted to make, and I think, again, seeing all the threes in the chat, we're fairly familiar with this idea, is that it's really easy to underestimate these tools. The garbage in, garbage out metaphor works quite well. If we use very generic prompts, we get very generic responses, and it pulls on very generic data. So as faculty, as staff, and as students, it's worthwhile understanding prompts as a way to understand these models better, what their capabilities are. Also for students thinking about this, going back to the comment about ethics, is 
if some students are able to use complex prompting to get these models to sing, other students don't know much about prompting, how are we going to have equitable classrooms? So today we're going to be sharing, or I'm going to be sharing a lot of prompts with you. And inside these prompts, I won't go over them, but there's prompt patterns. So ways of using these prompts, often in the field of prompt engineering. And you're going to see these patterns used today, mostly in examples and models. And what I've done is on the worksheet is anytime we've created a prompt, I put the prompt on the worksheet and I encourage you to try out the prompt as we go through, edit it for your own context. A couple of the patterns you're gonna see inside these prompts, one is the persona pattern, act as persona X, perform task Y. So by acting as different people, different personas, what we're finding is that the data and the generation produced is more accurate this has been researched, and I think anecdotally, we can also see it. Secondly, we're going to see single shot prompts. This is where we train the model with a little bit of data. So for example, as I'll demonstrate later, putting a sample learning objective into the model and then asking it to create learning objectives using this structure. We're going to look at refinement prompts. For example, evaluate this paragraph based on X or act as a cynical faculty member, evaluate this workshop based on your understanding of teaching and learning and your experience. Next is uh, output format. We'll talk about different types of formats that we can output in. We can output in CSVs, tables, XML, etc. And I see a question from the chat. Is there a useful prompting learning website that's recommended? On the worksheet, we've linked to the CTLT resource for different prompting. I also recommend a course. If you go to Coursera, Course Engineer, Prompt Engineering, there's a great course by Jules White, which will walk you through different prompt patterns and ways of prompting. I took it a few months ago. Excellent course. It really upped my understanding of prompting. And, you know, just broadly, I think these tools are just emerging or these technologies are just emerging. And already we're seeing that generative AI can be used in new ways of personalizing learning. So thinking about the concept of having scalable tutoring, um, what would it mean if each student could have a tutor for different subjects? Secondly, as we're seeing emerging skill development, what skills are needed these days in the different disciplines and areas that we're teaching our students about? Um, how are we going to help them learn these skills um, when things are changing so quickly? Tutoring, I've mentioned already. As we're going to demonstrate today, these tools, these technologies, you'll see I'm switching a little bit back and forth between tools and technologies. I prefer the term technologies. I think these are far beyond tools. I've taught so many things around tools. I often will say the word tools instead. Um, these are very powerful for learning material generation. So the ability to generate case studies, rubrics, questions for our quizzes, and then ways that we can evaluate things. So evaluating outputs, evaluating websites. I used ChatGPT yesterday to take a series of tweets and do semantic analysis on the different tweets in a tweet thread. Someone just asked for a hyperlink for our slides. Judy, if you don't mind sharing that, that would be great. And I'm going to turn things over to Manuel now. Thank you, Chris. Um... So this is Manuel. Um, I'm also part of CTLT, and it's a pleasure to see all of you with us today. Um, so for this activity, we basically um, are referring to an article by Molik and Molik, um, who have identified seven different ways of using GenAI. Uh, and we thought that was interesting to kind of ask you how you kind of anticipate using GenAI in the work that you're doing. Um, and in that case, you know, if you see AI as a tutor, basically for increasing knowledge or as a coach for increasing metacognition. So the way we learn basically as a mentor, 
you know, to provide balance, ongoing feedback as a colleague, um, basically like with us today to increase, you know, collaborative intelligence as a tool or as a way to extend the performance or even a simulator to help you with practice, you know, depending on the kind of domain that you're teaching. Um, so for this, uh, we're going to be using the annotation tool on, on, uh, on Zoom. So basically, if you look on, on top of your screen, you should see something that says view options. Uh, so it should indicate that, let's say, manually sharing screen, you should see something that says view options. And if you click on that little button uh, in the drop down menu, uh, look for something that says annotation. It's always a little bit tricky, tricky to find. Um, so if you look at the annotation, you click on this, then you'll have a little ribbon that op opens up. And then basically to vote, and I can see some of you already doing it, you can use the stamp. It's easier. And in the stamp, you have different options. You have the check mark, for instance. Um, and wait until I give you the instructions. So basically, there is no right or wrong answer. You can vote for more than one. Uh, but that's a chance for us to kind of see you know, where you are as a group. So you can even put the stamp directly on that little uh, check uh, checkbox or even on the right hand side. Um, so take a minute or two to kind of uh, give us a sense of where you stand with uh, the use of AI. You can use hearts, you know. I don't know if there's a Christmas tree, but that would be uh, actually quite nice in this time of year. Thank you, John, for voting. Yuri as well, thank you. And feel free to use the right hand side. And also, you know, maybe uh, you know there's an option that you don't see there. Feel free to use the text and say, "Oh, I use Gen AI as," and then you you know indicate that for us as well. That's still useful. Thank you, Farid. Oh. Okay. So I kind of see a fair distribution. Is that like some sort of? Uh, <laughs> a gift package or something, uh, a fair distribution, but mostly I can see that a lot of you consider Gen AI uh, or use Gen AI as a tool. So for extending performance, okay. Right. And maybe can I ask one of you who've been uh, saying, you know, you use this as a tool, maybe use your microphone and tell me more about the actual use of Gen AI that you make to extend performance. Anybody? Or well, simulator, like someone who says, you know, I use, uh, you know, Gen AI as a way to help with practice. Um, maybe one of you can just tell me more about, you know, what you're doing with this. No pressure. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, I also use it for programming and also sometimes help me to actually come up with, uh, you know, assignment questions. <laughs> design of kind of presentation of these things. Okay. Thank you, Kinshi. Okay. And are you generally happy with the, the result? Or do you have to kind of play a little bit back and forth until you get something that you think is uh, acceptable? Yeah, it's pretty good. You probably have to go one or two rounds before you get the one you want. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and you probably need to change your prompt. Sometimes you need to be more specific uh, about the direction you want to go. Then, mm -hmm. yeah, usually it turns out pretty good. Okay. Thanks. And that's actually something that you know through the different demos that Lucas is, is going to do for us today is that you know it's really this sort of iterative process of practice and practice. We don't assume you get everything right at the first at the first after the first uh, prompt, but it's really working around playing with this and until you get some something that you evaluate is uh you know uh, efficient for you thank you have for so as a mentor okay lisa okay yeah lisa what, what is stimuli generation so i do a lot of experiments hmm? yeah so i do a lot of experiments 
and um, sometimes to, to generate additional text or actually graphics. I'm playing a lot around more with Firefly and, and trying to do things in, in Photoshop uh, that I used to hire graphic design people to do. Wow. Okay. And what uh, Gen AI do you use for that? So it's actually integrated. It's currently in beta format, but it's integrated into Photoshop, the one that's actually available through UBC. It, it creates wonky results sometimes too, so it's certainly not perfect, but I'm playing around with it now. All right. I didn't know that. OK, thanks for letting me know. Yeah. Salim, thank you. OK, PBL template for project. Excellent. Okay. So I can see we've got a lot of Great answers, and thank you for using the chat. Actually, um, I'm, I'm totally fine with this. Uh, gives us a good sense of the the actual use that you make of Gen AI, um, and we have a fair distribution of of, of usage across, uh, you know, as a, as a tool, simulator, even mentor, coach, um, and we we had, I think, two weeks ago, um, a panel with uh, students, and a lot of students in that panel. A few of the panelists were actually indicating that they were using uh, Gen AI, you know, chat GPT in that case as a tutor. So it was interesting to see that not necessary as a tool to basically expect the work to be done automatically by some uh, some uh, uh, AI, but mostly like have a, have a way to uh, spend more time on tasks and, and really have a discussion with, uh, with the AI. So I thought that was an interesting perspective from students. Yes, perfect. Yep, yeah, that that was the right slide. Um, so in that case, now the the second step of of this session is really designing for learning, um, and you know the the idea is really like um, to approach, um, you know, the, the design of your course as a process, uh, and the intent of this process is really to foster uh, student learning in the context of Gen AI specifically. Uh, and using prompting techniques. So at this stage, uh, course design is kind of generally a reflection and iterative process, very much like, you know, the kind of use that you've been making with Gen AI, you know, not assuming that everything would just be perfect after the first prompt is kind of this sort of back and forth. And basically course design is the same type of, of, of work. It's kind of something that evolves over time. You modify things, you apply, you change. You reflect. You actually get student feedback, and 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 you and you keep modifying things. So it's a lot of back and forth, and that's basically what we try to communicate in in this session today. Um, and in the next slide, uh, we've basically given you um, uh, a chance to kind of approach that uh, course design from uh, different prompting techniques. So in that case. Uh, we're going to be using, uh, you know, uh, Gen AI to develop learning objectives, you know, and um, uh, Lucas is going to give you a different types of prompts to actually have Gen AI provide a bunch of objectives and reflect on those and, and modify. Uh, the second step is actually interesting, and I've got a graphic about this, is the backward design. So uh, in learning design, I guess we have a variety of frameworks that are used to kind of help you out with the course design process. Backward design, I would say, is one of the most popular one uh, developed by DeepThink. Um, and Lucas is going to show you how we could have Gen AI kind of reproduce the same time, type of process uh, uh, using the uh, Gen AI, which is quite fascinating, I have to say. Uh, then the third one will be working on course mind maps, like mapping up the, the, the big items of, of a course. Um, in that case, like create a mind map for first your course. Um, so that's that's going to be uh, one example, or even asking the big questions. You know, create a big question for one, and then have the Gen AI come up with something for you. Um, so we're going to have different ways of of helping you with uh, the design of your course from uh, using different techniques, I guess. So as I as I mentioned just a few minutes ago, we we have. A variety of frameworks um, that exist that can help you with uh, the design of your course. So it's very much a process. Some of you may be quite familiar. We have uh, some people with expertise in education. Some of you may be less familiar. So we just thought we would give you an idea of the DeepThink model. That is quite simple, I would say, but it, it's pretty um, interesting in a way that um, it works as 
as a cycle. So you basically start with the learning outcomes. Um, in that case, we oftentimes refer to Bloom's taxonomy with a list of verbs with different levels. Um, and then you try to say, okay, how am I going to assess my learning objectives? And then you can, you know, use different techni techniques or methods, assignments, a quiz, a case study. You have a variety of ways of doing this. And then you continue and say, okay, once, you know, I have a sense of my outcome, how, how you know, how am I going to evaluate it? The, the next step is really how do you put it into practice using activities or how do you actually teach something or develop it? Through instruction, so what you know basically happen in a, in a in a in a lecture or even a, in a, in a synchronous session, depending on the type of format that you have for your course. Um, so that's you know this idea of 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 uh, uh, the backward design. That's that's how we call this. Wonderful, thanks, Manuel. So I'm going to jump in now and. Just to kind of give you, orient you a little bit to where we're going now. Um, we're going to be doing three sections now. The first section we've started, we're going to look at course design space and using prompting and Gen AI to enhance and augment our course design. Then we're going to move into the activity and assessment space. And we'll look at how we can use Gen AI to augment our assessments, you know, leverage it to create more assessments, uh, better assessments, refine our assessments. And then we're going to move into the classroom space and talk about how we can integrate Gen AI within activities. All of these sections are structured in the same way. There are a series of demos that I'm going to do, and I really encourage you to follow along, try things out as I go. It looks like all of you have some experience. I'm going to alternate between Bing Copilot and ChatGPT4, and I'm doing this quite intentionally. I think ChatGPT4 right now, uh, outside of Gemini, which is coming from Google, is the most powerful model that we have to play with. Unfortunately, it is pay to play, and they, I don't think you can subscribe to it right now. They've frozen subscriptions, but I want to demo some of the things that it can do. I'm also going to demo with Bing because this is something that there has been a privacy impact assessment at UBC. And what that means is we can recommend Bing for our students. With that said, what I've been finding with Bing is it can be far more challenging to use than chat GPT. And it tends to try to be your kind of little chat buddy is what I find it. So it will try to, I'll ask it the other day, I asked Bing uh, using computer vision. I said, what am, you know, what are, what are you looking at? And it said a tennis racket. It was actually a badminton racket. And then it gave me the rules for tennis rather than just describing the images. So it kind of goes off the rails. So apologize if some of my demos go off the rails. So one way that we can use these tools, and maybe I'll get a thumbs up now from the group if you've used them in this way, is to create learning objectives. So could I get a thumbs up if you've used these tools to create learning objectives? All right, so I see a couple thumbs in the chat or sorry, on the interface, and that's great. And I'm going to use this prompt here right now and create learning objectives with it. And a couple things that I've done with this prompt. So I'm going into Bing now. Let's make sure that I'm in there for the screen sharing. And a couple things about this. One, I'm in precise mode. What I'm finding, and there's some debate online about this, is I'm finding the balance mode is terrible. It seems to be using, I think it has a engine called Prometheus as middleware that Microsoft's developed. And it's acting as my little chat buddy whenever I use balance. So I don't use balance. Creative, I found hit and miss. For me, precise works a little bit better. In terms of the prompt, you'll see that I'm very specific with it. So create three lesson level learning objectives that are measurable and aligned with Bloom's taxonomy. One thing that I find fascinating about Gen AI, especially when we think about copyright, is that 
it does have access to books like Bloom's Taxonomy. Um, so you can get it to refer to different approaches for learning objectives, for exam writing, just by naming the author. Use this learning objective as an example. And this is where I start using a little bit of single shot. Um, what I realized is I didn't put the subject in here. So I'm just going to add that aligned with Bloom's taxonomy. So let me just say for first year physics. So first year physics learning objectives that are measurable. And let's see what we get. And again, you never know what the output will be in these tools. And I'm especially uncomfortable with Bing that it's just going to kind of go off the rails. So now it's going to give me specific learning objectives in this area. And you can take a look at the measure, the learning objectives and see that they are, these are measurable, they're specific, um, and they're based roughly on that learning objective that I already added. So one way that we can use these tools is to generate lots of learning objectives and rather than going through a process we're always creating the learning objectives, start thinking about sorting through these learning objectives, adapting them for our course design. I'm going to move through the slides without sharing full slides, just to make it a little bit easier now for the demos. The next example I wanted to give you is this backward design table. So what I found is that generative AI is quite good at creating backward design tables as part of the course design process. Again, I think we need to be a little bit careful in that we need to go through this. We need to check it to see if it's accurate. These tools still aren't 100% accurate. It may hallucinate. It may give us information that's way out of context, um, but it can seem to understand DFINK's approach as well as create these tables. So let's try this with Bing first. And I'm just gonna grab this objective. And I'll mention that to create these prompts, one thing that I've been doing, and I'm not sure if you have in the room, is I've been putting a prompt into ChatGPT, and then I've been saying, improve my prompt to get a better output. And I'm getting much better prompts by doing this. It's actually made my prompts a lot longer. So using the following learning objectives, create a backward design table based on the work of DFINK. So I'm giving it a lot of structure here. I've given it the course structure. I've given it a couple learning objectives. And let's see what sort of output we can get from that. Again, let's try Bing out. You never know, it could go way off the rails. But what I do like about Bing uh, particularly is it gives me these things in a nice table format. So let's take a look. It's given me formative and summative assessment, which is interesting, um, rather than giving me just assessment, which is in Fink's um, approach to backward design. So it's gone through that. It's given me the formative assessment, and it's given me potential readings that I can use. So your turn. I've given you a couple examples of ways that we can use these tools in learning design. What I would like you to do now is spend, let's go five minutes on the activity sheet, try the learning objective prompt out, try the backward design prompt out, or try a prompt that might be related to course design that we haven't talked about. At the end of five minutes, I'm going to ask you to share the output in the chat and also your reflections. How was the quality of the output? What was missing? What would you do differently in terms of prompting? So let's start our five minutes now. And I'm quite curious what sort of prompts you're going to be able to generate and what sort of outputs you're going to be able to get. So go ahead, we'll start the timer now. And Manuel mentioned in the chat that he often refers to Angelo and Cross 50 classroom assessment techniques 
to further explore assessment techniques that Gen AI may have generated. And it, it I have found it excellent at classroom assessment techniques. Another educational framework I use is Liberating Structures, which is open online. So it makes sense that it was scraped, but it's able to pull on different Liberating Structures and generate um, output based on those. So thanks for sharing for that activity and let's uh, keep going. And we're gonna do something similar um, but instead of talking about course design now, we're going to talk about designing assessments and assignments using Gen AI. And again, we'll take that same flow. What we're going to think about is a couple ways that we can use Gen AI to generate learning materials. So um, first of all is assignments. And I have some example prompts around this. Secondly is creating questions. And I think creating exam questions, the examples I've heard from faculty, I've heard two interesting examples, using Gen AI to create exam questions when they need to create an exam for the purposes of accommodation. I helped a faculty member do this recently, and they're having to, you know, create a whole new exam. And secondly, I know Varada Kohler in computer science who presented as part of the CTLT um, Gen AI Studio last month talked about using it to create randomized questions. So she could have multiple randomized questions that she used. We're also going to think about creating rubrics with it, as well as creating scenarios with these tools. So the first example I wanted to give you is creating assignments. And again, um, I think that it requires, as Louisa mentioned, kind of some expertise knowledge in understanding these assignments. And in this case, what I've done is I've used the work of Eric Mazur, who if you've read Eric Mazur in the context of physics, he takes an approach called peer instruction, which is a highly structured approaches for assignments. So in this case, the prompt is create a comprehensive peer instruction activity for first year university physics students around understanding displacement within a frame of reference. And I've asked it to ground the activity in Eric Mazur's work. So in this case, um, I'm going to use Bing again um, for the chat. Just give me a moment here. And let's see what we can get from this particular assignment. So create a comprehensive peer instruction activity. And so it's going to come up with the learning objectives in this case, with the materials needed. And what I like about this is it's starting to build on the notion of peer instruction. So a concept introduction, individuals think about something, they get together in a group, and then they answer a question again. And it's going through and it's creating the conceptual questions for this activity. Um, I could refine this further if I wanted to. And, you know, in order to get more specific answers, I'm finding by going through a process of refinement, I'm getting um, better results. So act as an educational assessment expert. And evaluate this activity. And I'm going to ask it what criteria it used. Luckily, spelling doesn't count. Let's see if it's able to do this. Bing allows you with Enterprise Bing, you can go back and forth 30 times. So it's not giving me too many critiques. Um, I would expect that GPT-4 would be able to give me a little bit more critiques on that. Um, and then what I do typically is I ask it to rewrite it based on the particular critiques it used. 
So assignments was one example. The other example I wanted to mention was questions, and I'm not going to demonstrate this one. But again, by using very specific prompts, so in this case, you are an expert teacher in cognitive psychology, I'm using a role-based prompt here, you're skilled in creating intriguing and thought-provoking questions for upper-level undergraduate students, as well as in assessing their work effectively. So you can really build out these roles and give the model some characteristics. You've prepared two questions with solutions for an upcoming quiz. However, due to scheduling conflicts, you need to develop a separate quiz. Could you please help develop comparative questions? And then I've given it a model of a couple questions, again, using that single shot. And what I've found is get you get fairly good quality multiple choice questions by doing this. The third example I'm going to demonstrate, again, using Bing, is creating rubrics. And these tools are quite good at, or these technologies are quite good at creating rubrics. When you use Bing for creating rubrics, what's also nice is the rubrics exportable into Excel. Um, you can also ask it to generate a rubric similar to the Canvas Learning Management System or similar to grade scope if you want a particular format of a rubric to develop. So again, in this prompt, which I'm going to demonstrate now, I, I asked it to act as a communicating science instructor with an expertise in science communication, create a rubric. I told it what it's going to assess. And I explain specifically what the rubric needs to have, including gradation levels. So let's go in here. I'm going to create a new topic so that it doesn't have some memory of the old topic. And let's give it a try. I think I prefer Bing to GPT-4 for rubric creation, um, just because of the table layout that it gives it. So it's going to give me a table layout now. It's going to add each of the different criterias as well as, you know, what unsatisfactory is, what satisfactory is. You'll see that it's talking about scientific language. It's talking about audience engagement, two aspects of science communication. So again, this typically the results aren't perfect but there's something you can work on. And what I like about Bing now is that I can download it so I can export this rubric. Or if I scroll up to the top and I click on the edit in Excel, I can edit this rubric directly in Excel. So here's the same rubric or a slightly different model of the rubric. The last one I wanted to mention to you was creating scenarios and case studies. I recently did a workshop where there was a lawyer taking the workshop and she started running some hypotheticals. Hypotheticals are examples of case laws that are hypothetical. And after she had finished using GPT, she said, I don't think I'll ever write a hypothetical again. Um, in a lot of our teaching contexts, we're using cases, we're using scenarios. And these tools can be quite good at creating scenarios for us that we can reuse within our teaching. So I am going to demonstrate this one in GPT-4. And in this case, I asked the tool to write a complex case based on the idea of teacher digital identity. And I chose this one because it's an area that I work in. I do, I do a course called Digital... Um, the digital tattoo where we instruct um, teacher candidates, prospective pharmacists around their digital identities. So I have an idea of what these case studies should look like. So it's using British Columbia now. It's talking about navigating digital identity. You'll see that it understands I'm speaking about a teacher candidate. It's talking about her social media presence. It's thinking about an incident that happened, and it talks about the complexity of the case. So in my case with these workshops, this would require some elaborating on it. However, it would be a good start to a reasonable case study that I could use when teaching these classes.
So again, over to you. I'm just going to do a full screen share. And in the spirit of kind of experimenting and playing with these tools, I'm going to give us a few minutes now to create a rubric for your course using the provided template or an imaginary course if you wanted. Create three questions that you could use with your students to practice a concept in your course. And if you want to, try creating a case study or a scenario. So just like before, I'll give you a few minutes to run this, and then I'll get folks to share what they got back. And I, I see a question in the chat about from Louise asking about students using our material to generate their own test questions. I mean, that's got a lot of layers to the question, Louisa. I guess one is I love the idea that they can do that. The other challenge here is that by taking our material and putting it into these systems, they're putting it out into the open and it brings up questions around intellectual property and you know what's being done with this material, what happens if the data links, leaks, et cetera. but as um, it's also a great learning activity. So I'll give folks a few minutes. Again, go in there, give these prompts a try. And Louise, I wanted to share a quick uh, way that I've been using it with my son. He's 13 years old. He's in um, grade eight right now, or grade seven, sorry, in his... Um, in his class, he forgot to study for an exam. So what we did is we took a picture of his notes, which were pretty messy, and took his notes, took the picture, put the picture into chat GPT-4, and asked it to create questions based on the notes, and asked it to test him and help him understand the concepts one at a time. So he spent about half an hour going back and forth with the tool, having it ask him questions. If he did it wrong, it would correct him and learning the material. I kind of supervised it because, again, you're never sure about the accuracy, but it does really open up different learning approaches, especially from a grade seven student who's probably using very inefficient study methods to read off their notes and try to memorize. All right, so we've talked about so far thinking about Gen AI in course design, thinking about Gen AI in assignment design. What I'd like to talk about now is how we might think about using it within our classes. And maybe I'll get a thumbs up again from the group. Um, could you give me a thumbs up if you are using this in your teaching now as a core, you know, getting students to use this in a course assignment. And I see a couple thumbs up there. So Sky looks like she's using it, great. So a couple folks are using it in course assignment. And when we get through this section, I'd love to hear from folks about how they're using these tools in course assignment. So first of all, I think when we're starting to use these tools, it's worth thinking about uh, equity around using these tools in the classroom. And now that Bing has a PIA at UBC or a privacy impact assessment, this is less of a concern, but I still think there's students who are going to be reluctant to using these tools. What's nice about Bing is that students don't need to log into it. And so this is going to assage a lot of students. But how are we going to ensure that if we do an assignment in the classroom, there's equity built into the assignment? Meaning, do we need to prepare students for prompting if one student can generate something better? What about students using a paid tool? What about students who are uncomfortable using the tool, period? Is there something equitable we can get for them? Number two, is how do we support them using these technologies, including things like understanding the biases within these tools, understanding the privacy that putting private data in these tools could result in that data leaking out. I don't know if you saw it recently, but 
um, a researcher was able to get chat GPT to link pers personally identifiable data by asking it to write the word palm forever. And by doing that, it started giving out personal information that had been put into it. So how do we help students understand that these tools do have privacy limitations? How do we help students understand that sometimes these tools are going to lie to them and tell them things that are incorrect? Number three, because these tools are emerging so quickly, how can we collaborate with our students and partner with our students to integrate these tools within our teaching? So a couple ways that we've been seeing faculty using these tools, as well as um, I've linked a document in the worksheet from the University of Central Florida that has about 50 different ways you could use these tools. And I've adapted that a little bit for this section. So one way we can use it in the classroom is to get students to analyze the output. So this could be creating their own work, comparing the output for inaccuracies, looking at the output for biases, um, looking at the output for embedded perspectives that may be within the output. This is an example of doing this would be getting students to create get ChatGPT to provide a detail output and then try to look at the output and find out the extent that it's biased. Patrick Pennyfather does this in theater and film at UBC with image generation. So getting it to generate an image, say of a computer science faculty member, often a tool like Midjourney will generate a, a ma older male, older white male when it does this. So the idea of using these tools for evaluation and analysis. Here's an example from Yale where they've done this. So each student posed a question relevant to their problem statement and then annotated it with GPT. And they focused on ways that the AI write-up may be inaccurate, misleading, incomplete, or unethical. It also, in this assignment, he helped them think about how ChatGPT helped them refine their research question. I think one challenge of this type assignment that we're going to see more and more, and the um, researcher Ethan Mollick, who if you get a chance to follow on LinkedIn, writes some great stuff about generative AI, mentioned that in his classes, as ChatGPT4 comes out and as these tools gets more powerful, he's finding it harder and harder to get output that has as many inaccuracies in it. Therefore, it's harder to evaluate. The second way that I'm seeing we're seeing faculty using these tools is have them use it as part of a generative process. So acting as chat GPT as a partner or Bing AI as a partner, someone to do the assignment with them to generate new things from the assignment and to kind of take it further and augment their work a little bit. So this is an example from that University of Florida um, paper. So students brainstorm a new business idea for products or services related to their area of interest and ask students to select a topic, combine it in chat GPT with a list of their own skills, and then use it as a brainstorming companion to kind of take things farther. Again, there's a little bit of an evaluation piece in here, um, but they are using it as a tool to kind of augment or uh, generate more or brainstorm with the tool. This is an example from UBC from Food Science, where students were asked to use ChatGPT to generate formulations for specific food products to make them chewier, sweeter, etc. So again, going a little bit further and augmenting the output of their assignment. The third example of types of assignment we can develop are self-study assignments. We know that students are already using these tools as part of their studies. So finding ways of helping students use these tools, giving them prompts to use them and helping them do independent study with these tools.
So assignments that scaffold students' independent learning and provide them with more practice assignments. For example, summarizing long articles. Generative AI is quite good at summarizing long articles. In this case, for the prompt, students summarize the following article, write 10 bullet points as if the reader is in middle school, and 10 bullet points as if the person is a leader in industry. So the ability to kind of take apart articles, synthesize them. What's interesting with Bing now is you can actually take a URL for an article, put it into Bing, and ask it to do a quick summary of the article. Another way, and this is an example that Louisa mentioned earlier, was getting these tools to create self-quizzing questions for students. So having them use your course notes if you're comfortable with the IP, or having them use a particular topic area and create a quiz or a game to test themselves and to learn within these areas.